Section 3 of In Vino Veritas From Stages on Life's Way by Soren Kierkegaard Translated by Lee M. Hollander 1880-1972 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 3 Constantine's speech. Constantine spoke as follows. There is a time to keep silence and a time to speak, and now it seems to be the time to speak briefly, for our young friend has spoken much and very strangely. His vis comica has made a struggle and sepito proelio because his speech was full of doubt, as he himself is, sitting there now, a perplexed man who knows not whether to laugh or weep or fall in love. In fact, had I had foreknowledge of his speech, such as he demands one should have of love, I should have forbidden him to speak, but now it is too late. I shall bid you then, dear fellow banqueteers, gladsome and merry to be, and even if I cannot enforce this, I shall ask you to forget each speech so soon as it is made, and to wash it down with a single draught. And now as to woman, about whom I shall speak. I too have pondered about her, and I have finally discovered the category to which she belongs. I too have sought, but I have found too and I have made a matchless discovery, which I shall now communicate to you. Woman is understood correctly only when placed in the category of the joke. It is man's function to be absolute, to act in an absolute fashion, or to give expression to the absolute. Woman's sphere lies in her relativity, between beings so radically different, no true reciprocal relation can exist. Precisely in this incommensurability lies the joke. And with woman the joke was born into the world. It is to be understood, however, that man must know how to stick to his role of being absolute, for else nothing is seen. That is to say, something exceedingly common is seen, viz., that man and woman fit each other, he as a half-man and she as a half-man. The joke is not an ascetic, but an abortive ethical category. Its effect on thought is about the same as the impression we receive if a man were solemnly to begin making a speech, recite a comma or two with his pronouncement, then say, hmm, dash, and then stop. Thus with woman, one tries to cover her with the ethical category, one thinks of human nature, one opens one's eyes, one fastens one's glances on the most excellent maiden in question. An effort is made to redeem the claims of the ethical demand, and then one grows ill at ease and says to oneself, Ah, this is undoubtedly a joke. The joke lies indeed in applying that category to her and measuring her by it, because it would be idle to expect serious results from her, but just that is the joke, because if one could demand it of her, it would not be a joke at all. A mighty poor joke indeed it would be to place her under the air pump and draw the air out of her. Indeed, it were a shame but to blow her up to supernatural size and let her imagine herself to have attained all the ideality which a little maiden of sixteen imagines she has, that is the beginning of the game, and indeed the beginning of a highly entertaining performance. No youth has half so much imaginary ideality as a young girl, but we shall soon be even, as says the tailor in the proverb, for her ideality is but an illusion. If one fails to consider woman from this point of view, she may cause irreparable harm, but through my conception of her she becomes harmless and amusing. 
for a man there is nothing more shocking than to catch himself twaddling it destroys all true ideality for one may repent of having been a rascal one may feel sorry for not having meant a word of what one said but to have talked nonsense sheer nonsense to have meant all one said and behold it was all nonsense that is too disgusting for repentance incarnate to put up with but this is not the case with woman she has a prescriptive right to transfigure herself in less than twenty-four hours in the most innocent and pardonable nonsense for far is it from her ingenuous soul to wish to deceive one indeed she meant all she said and now she says the precise opposite but with the same amiable frankness for now she is willing to stake everything on what she said last now in case a man in all seriousness surrenders to love he may be called fortunate indeed if he succeeds in obtaining an insurance if indeed he is able to obtain it anywhere for so inflammable a material as woman is most likely to arouse the suspicions of an insurance agent just consider for a moment what he has done in thus identifying himself with her if some fine new year's night she goes off like some fireworks he will promptly follow suit and even if this should not happen he will have many a close call and what may he not lose he may lose his all for there is but one absolute antithesis to the absolute and that is nonsense therefore let him not seek refuge in some society for morally tainted individuals for he is not morally tainted far from it only he has been reduced in absurdum and beatified in nonsense that is has been made a fool of but this will never happen among men if a man should sputter off in this fashion i would scorn him if he should fool me by his cleverness i need but apply the ethical category to him and the danger is trifling if things go too far i shall put a bullet through his brain but to challenge a woman what is that if you please who does not see that it is a joke just as when xerxes had the sea whipped when othello murders desmona granting she really had been guilty he has really gained nothing for he has been duped and a dupe he remains for even by his murdering her he only makes a concession with regard to a consequence which originally made him ridiculous whereas elvira may be an altogether pathetic figure when arming herself with a dagger to obtain revenge the fact that shakespeare has conceived othello as a tragic figure even disregarding the calamity that desdemona is innocent is to be explained and indeed to perfect satisfaction by the hero being a colored person for a colored person dear fellow banqueters who cannot be assumed to represent spiritual qualities a colored person i say who therefore becomes green in his face when his ire is aroused which is a physiological fact a colored man may indeed become tragic if he is deceived by a woman just as a woman has all the pathos of tragedy on her side when she is betrayed by a man a man who flies into a rage may perhaps become tragic but a man of whom one may expect a developed mentality he will either not become jealous or he will become ridiculous if he does and most of all when he comes running with a dagger in his hand a pity that shakespeare has not presented us with a comedy of this description in which the claim raised by a woman's infidelity is turned down by irony for not every one who is able to see the comical element in this situation is able also to develop the thought and give it dramatic embodiment let us but imagine socrates surprising xanthope in the act for it would be unsocratic even to think of socrates being particularly concerned about his wife's fidelity or still worse spying on her imagine it 
and i believe that the fine smile which transformed the ugliest man in athens into the handsomest would for the first time have turned into a roar of laughter it is incomprehensible why aristophanes who so frequently made socrates the butt of his ridicule neglected to have him run on the stage shouting where is she where is she so that i may kill her i e my unfaithful xanthope for really it does not matter greatly whether or no socrates was made a cuckold and all that xanthope may do in this regard is wasted labor like snapping one's fingers in one's pocket for socrates remains the intellectual hero even with a horn on his forehead but if he had in fact become jealous and had wanted to kill xanthope alas then would xanthope have exerted a power over him such as the entire greek nation and his sentence of death could not to make him ridiculous a cuckold is comical then with respect to his wife but he may be regarded as becoming tragical with respect to other men in this fact we may find an explanation of the spanish conception of honor but the tragic element resides chiefly in his not being able to obtain redress and the anguish of his suffering consists really in its being devoid of meaning which is terrible enough to shoot the woman to challenge her to despise her all this would only serve to render the poor man still more ridiculous for woman is the weaker sex this consideration enters everywhere and confuses all if she performs a great deed she is admired more than man because it is more than was expected of her if she is betrayed all the pathos is on her side but if a man is deceived one has scant sympathy and little patience while he is present and laughs at him when his back is turned look you therefore is it advisable betimes to consider woman as a joke the entertainment she affords is simply incomparable let one consider her a fixed quantity and oneself a relative one let one by no means contradict her for that would simply be helping her let one never doubt what she says but rather believe her every word let one gallivant about her with eyes rendered unsteady by unspeakable admiration and blissful intoxication and with the mincing steps of a worshipper let one languishingly fall on one's knees then lift up one's eyes up to her languishingly and heave a breath again let one do all she bids one like an obedient slave and now comes the cream of the joke we need no proof that woman can speak i e use words unfortunately however she does not possess sufficient reflection for making sure against her in the long run which is at most eight days contradicting herself unless indeed man by contradicting her exerts a regulative influence so the consequence is that within a short time confusion will reign supreme if one has not done what she told one to the confusion would pass unnoticed for she forgets again as quickly as she talks but since her admirer has done all and has been at her beck and call in every instance the confusion is only too glaring the more gifted the woman the more amusing the situation for the more gifted she is the more imagination she will possess now the more imagination she possesses the greater airs she will give herself and the greater the confusion which is bound to become evident in the next instant in life such entertainment is rarely had because this blind obedience to a woman's whims occurs but seldom and if it does in some languishing swain most likely he is not qualified to see the fun the fact is the ideality a little maiden assumes in moments when her imagination is at work is encountered nowhere else whether in gods or man but it is all the more entertaining to believe her and to add fuel to the fire as i remarked the fun is simply incomparable indeed i know it for a fact 
because i have at times not been able to sleep at night with the mere thought of what new confusions i should live to see through the agency of my sweetheart and my humble zeal to please her indeed no one who gambles in a lottery will meet with more remarkable combinations than he who has a passion for this game for this is sure that every woman without exception possesses the same qualifications for being resolved and transfigured in nonsense with a gracefulness a nonchalance an assurance such as befits the weaker sex being a right-minded lover one naturally discovers every possible charm in one's beloved now when discovering genius in the above sense one ought not to let it remain a mere possibility but ought rather to develop it into virtuosity i do not need to be more specific and more cannot be said in a general way yet every one will understand me just as one may find entertainment in balancing a cane on one's nose in swinging a tumbler in a circle without spilling a drop in dancing between eggs and in other games as amusing and profitable likewise and not otherwise in living with his beloved the lover will have a source of incomparable entertainment and food for most interesting study in matters pertaining to love let one have absolute belief not only in her protestations of fidelity one soon tires of that game but in all those explosions of inviolable romanticism by which she would probably perish if one did not contrive a safety valve through which the sighs and the smoke and the aria of romanticism may escape and make her worshipper happy let one compare her admiringly to juliet the difference being only that no person ever as much as thought of touching a hair on her romeo's head with regard to intellectual matters let one hold her capable of all and if one has been lucky enough to find the right woman in a trice one will have a cantankerous authoress whilst wonderingly shading one's eyes with one's hand and duly admiring what the little black hen may yield besides it is altogether incomprehensible why socrates did not choose this course of action instead of bickering with xanthope oh well to be sure he wished to acquire practice like the riding master who even though he has the best trained horse yet knows how to tease him in such fashion that there is good reason for breaking him in again let me be a little more concrete in order to illustrate a particular and highly interesting phenomenon a great deal has been said about feminine fidelity but rarely with any discretion from a purely ascetic point of view this fidelity is to be regarded as a piece of poetic fiction which steps on the stage to find her lover a fiction which sits by the spinning wheel and waits for her lover to come but when she has found him or he has come why then ascetics is at a loss her infidelity on the other hand as contrasted with her previous fidelity is to be judged chiefly with regard to its ethical import when jealousy will appear as a tragic passion there are three possibilities so the case is favorable for woman for there are two cases of fidelity as against one of infidelity inconceivably great is her fidelity when she is not altogether sure of her cavalier and ever so inconceivably great is it when he repels her fidelity the third case would be her infidelity now granted one has sufficient intellect and objectivity to make reflections one will find sufficient justification in what has been said for my category of the joke our young friend whose beginning in a manner deceived me seems to be on the point of entering into this matter but backed out again dismayed at the difficulty and yet the explanation is not difficult providing one really sets about it seriously to make unrequited love and death correspond to one another 
and providing one is serious enough to stick to his thought and so much seriousness one ought to have for the sake of a joke of course this phrase of unrequited love being death originated either with a woman or a womanish male its origin is easily made out seeing that it is one of those categorical outbursts which spoken with great bravado on the spur of the moment may count on a great and immediate applause for although this business is said to be a matter of life and death yet the phrase is meant for immediate consumption like cream puffs although referring to daily experience it is by no means binding on him who is to die but only obliges the listener to rush post haste to the assistance of the dying lover if a man should take to using such phrases it would not be amusing at all for he would be too despicable to laugh at woman however possesses genius is lovable in the measure she possesses it and is amusing at all times well then the languishing lady dies of love why certainly for did she not say so herself in this matter she is pathetic for woman has enough courage to say what no man would have the courage to do so then she dies in saying so i have measured her by ethical standards do ye likewise dear fellow banqueteers and understand your aristotle aright now he observes very correctly that woman cannot be used in tragedy and very certainly her proper sphere is the pathetic and serious divertisement the half-hour face not the five-act drama so then she dies but should she for that reason not be able to love again why not that is if it be possible to restore her to life now having been restored to life she is of course a new being another person that is and begins afresh and falls in love for the first time nothing remarkable in that ah death great is thy power not the most violent emetic and not the most powerful laxative could ever have the same purging effect the resulting confusion is capital if one but is attentive and does not forget a dead man is one of the most amusing characters to be met with in life strange that more use is not made of him on the stage for in life he is seen now and then when you come to think of it even one who has only been seemingly dead is a comical figure the one who is really dead certainly contributes to our entertainment all one can reasonably expect of a man all depends on whether one is attentive i myself had my attention called to it one day as i was walking with one of my acquaintances a couple passed us i judged from the expression on his face that he knew them and asked whether that was the case why yes he answered i know them very well and especially the lady for she is my departed one what departed one i asked why my departed first love he answered indeed this is a strange affair she said i shall die and that very moment she departed naturally enough by death else one might have insured her beforehand in the widow's insurance too late dead she was and dead she remained and now i wander about as says the poet vainly seeking the grave of my lady love that i may shed my tears thereon thus this broken-hearted man who remained alone in the world though it consoled him to find her pretty far along with some other man it is a good thing for the girls thought i that they don't have to be buried every time they die for if parents have hitherto considered a boy child to be the most expensive the girls might become even more so a simple case of infidelity is not as amusing by far i mean if a girl should fall in love with someone else and should say to her lover i cannot help it save me from myself but to die from sorrow because she cannot endure being separated from her lover by his journey to the west indies to have to put up with his departure however and then at his return be not only not dead but attached to someone else for all time 
that certainly is a strange fate for a lover to undergo no wonder then that the heartbroken man at times consoled himself with the burthen of an old song which runs hurrah for you and me i say we never shall forget that day now forgive me dear fellow banqueteers if i have spoken at too great length and empty a glass to love and to woman beautiful she is and lovely if she be considered ascetically that is undeniable but as has often been said and as i shall say also one ought not to remain standing here but should go on consider her then ethically and you will hardly have begun to do so before the humor of it will become apparent even plato and aristotle assume that woman is an imperfect form an irrational quantity that is one which might sometime in a better world be transformed into a man in this life one must take her as she is and what this is becomes apparent very soon for she will not be content with the ascetic sphere but goes on she wants to be emancipated and she has the courage to say so let her wish be fulfilled and the amusement will be simply incomparable when constantin had finished speaking he forthwith ruled victor eremita to begin he spoke as follows End of section 3